dealt with the effects, and we'll hear from them <coughs> later in the program. Uh, this is a program that we started five years ago on land, uh, linking agriculture for networking and development, and is a partnership with the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers. And the whole purpose of this is to try to connect the ag community with economic development and manufacturing. If you look around the room this morning, you'll see uh, hopefully a few folks that you don't know or maybe haven't been in the room with, and that's the purpose of these meetings. At this time, I will invite Melissa with the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers to come up and offer some remarks. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, we got to try this again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's just a tad bit better. We'll, we'll let that one slide. So, uh, welcome to land. We're really excited to be here in Henderson today. Um, I believe Lingo, our executive director, sends his regrets that he couldn't be with you today, so I had to pinch it for you. Um, and so we, we really want to tell you just a little bit about the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers. How many of you are familiar with CAM? Yeah. Do you like it? That's, that's good. Um, we want to be able to start thinking about how we link um, agricultural manufacturing and farming into CAM as much as we possibly can. And a lot, um, a lot of output in Kentucky, of course, comes from manufacturing. So here's some stats for you if you aren't familiar with them. Uh, in 2019, we had total output of a little over $38 million in, in Kentucky. Um, you know, we've got over 4,500 manufacturers um, and that includes many of the agricultural manufacturers, too. Um, we've got 244,000 manufacturing employees as of in 2020. And we export over $24 billion, um, and that's a billion with a B. So you can continually see that manufacturing makes a gigantic uh, difference for our economy. Um, so who are we? The Kentucky Association of Manufacturers. So we've been around, believe it or not, since 1911. Um, I've been around since this year. Uh, I'm not that old. If I do, I have really great genes. Um, we create, support, and protect manufacturing environment. So um, I am the member relations director, so I'm the person that gets to come out um, and meet with you as a manufacturer or a farmer or um, just look at your business and figure out how it is that we can connect resources for you, um, how we, you know, we talk about things like the workforce pipeline, we talk about things like your supply chain, um, and basically just the incentives that helps you as a business. And what I have found out in doing this for many years is that we don't know what we don't know, basically. Um, there's a whole host of different resources um, that's available to you as a business um, that I can promise you you don't know about. So my, my career has been spent in workforce development, economic development, and education. And I am continually surprised every day by I don't know what I don't know and I learn something else about a new resource that's out there. I see a few of you shaking your heads that are kind of in that system. Um, traditionally, we have been involved in chemical count, the, the chemical industry through the CIC Chemical Industry Council. Um, of course, we have a lot of automotive manufacturing, so of course we've been working a lot through um, the Kentucky Automotive Industry Association, and then of course our number one export industry right now is aerospace, so we work a lot with aerospace. And that's why we really wanted to partner with land because we feel like we should be helping the agricultural manufacturers much more than what we had in the past. So that's going to be one of our goals coming up. So um, in that essence, you've got a card on your table in front of you. Um, if you would like us to come out and visit you, if we can connect some dots for you and figure out what you may not know that we can try to help you with, um, please fill that card out, leave it on the back table back there, and we'll make sure we follow up with you. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about a few of the initiatives that CAM has. Um, we have a wage and benefit survey right now that we're doing, so if you are one of the lucky businesses um, that get to um, hopefully 
complete that for us, it really helps us help you. Uh, many times we have individuals and businesses come to us who are expanding, um, who are looking at alternative ways to grow their business, um, and they want to know how competitive am I as a business. And so a lot of times we'll pull that information from the wage and benefit survey. Um, and then secondly, we try our best to also um, look at continuing education and business development. You know, we've got a, new, a lot of new entrepreneurs coming up, so we try to work with entrepreneurs as much as we can and connect those resources. I remember starting my own business. I had no idea. I had a blindfold on, basically. Didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so we want to make sure that we connect them with mentors to, to help them out. Um, and certainly we do a lot of building partnerships within communities, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce or whether it's your local community and technical college, industrial authorities. Um, we try to make sure that we have some relationships with those entities um, to, again, connect the resources as best we can. Um, KCTCS has, has been a huge partner for us um, in many initiatives. Um, we work with them a lot through training. Um, so if you have employees who uh, need training or if you are expanding your business, have new pieces of equipment, that type of thing, um, we try to make sure we work with KCTCS as best we can to, to be able to fulfill that, those needs. Um, and then last but not least, um, I mentioned AGC on here, the Associated General Contractors of Kentucky. Um, we are getting ready to enter into a partnership with them on a mobile workshop, um, which is pretty exciting. So uh, probably look for more information to come in the next coming months with that. So as always, I get a lot of questions about data. Um, and this is part of my last hat that I wore for the state of Kentucky. Um, I looked at data across the system that connected workforce, education, and economic development and business. And so I wanted to pop a few things up here, just so that you realize where you are as a community. Um, there's a program at the state level that takes a look at all the data is related to your county. Um, and what you are seeing here is all blue numbers. If these numbers were not blue and they were red, you might be in a little bit of, of trouble. But it shows what type of citizenship that you have and the entities that are working together on your behalf. Because right now you've got 92%, almost a 92% graduation rate in high school. You have a 28% associate degree rate from those coming out of high school or adults going in to get an associate degree. Um, that may seem low to you, but actually that's a little bit higher than the average in our county. Um, you have a 53% that has some type of education or certifications past high school. And most of the time when we talk to employers, they tell us that you must have something beyond a high school diploma. You have to have a high school diploma, and they urge you to do so, but you usually need something beyond that. Maybe not a four-year degree, maybe a two-year degree, but something in between, some type of certification. And then what's interesting also is you have 11% of individuals between the ages of 18 and 64 without a high school diploma. Um, and we look at these numbers because normally when we begin to think about the workforce pipeline, um, we look at the data, and this is what the data is telling us. So what's also interesting, just so that you kind of are in the know, is when we look at entry level wages, and when you see that black outline on the screen, you see uh, a number there of 34,956. That's the average salary in Henderson County, or in Green River. So it's Henderson County and the area around it. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the experienced wage is 71,2. And a lot of times we try to pull, remember I talked about the wage and benefit survey, we try to pull this information so that again, you know how competitive you are with other parts of the state, other states, other counties, other businesses, etc. So at any point that you feel like you would like to have some of this wage data and information, um, any of this data basically we can pull for you uh, to show some type of competitive rate if you need it. And I always do this for fun. Um, so if I went, does everybody know what indeed.com is? Um, so you know if you are a person looking for work, you might go online and you look at Indeed.com. Um, so I just thought it would be fun to pull agriculture and farming, any jobs that are within a 50 mile radius of here. 
what do you think the highest, what's the average wage that those jobs are paying? Anybody want to guess? Most of those jobs are paying, my guess is? 20? 20? Most of them are paying $25,000 a year, and the smallest amount we're paying $50,000 a year. How about benefits? So most of them have health insurance, 401k, dental insurance, etc. If I go on to job type, there are 58 full-time positions, six part-time, one temporary. Here's where they were shown. Here's the job. So they were first located in Owensboro, then Evansville, Morganfield, Henderson, Beaver Dam. And then here's the companies that Melissa, as a job seeker, would log on to Indeed.com. This is the jobs. These are the jobs that I would see that are available. How many of you are hiring right now? Raise them high, I need to see them. Okay, so there's a few of you. Are you on this list? No, you're not on this list. So why do I talk about this? I talk about it because it's a lot of perception. So Melissa, that is college graduate, high school student, um, adult who just got laid off, whatever it may be, and I wanna be an agricultural in manufacturing or farming or something related to agriculture. And the perception of me going on Indeed.com shows me what jobs are out there. So I think it's really important that we think about perception, perception of your industry. Are you hiring? Are you not hiring? What kind of jobs do you have? Because if it's not out there, <coughs> there's no awareness out there, we need to think about those things. Okay, last but not least, again, uh, just so that uh, we offer you something that we can help you with. Any of these areas, data, education programs, supply chains, a really big topic these days. Um, talent pipeline, where you're getting your employees, are you linked into certain areas? Um, economic development needs. We try to connect those dots as best we can for you. So again, uh, that card, if you need any of these resources, we'd be glad to help you with that. So with that, I'll turn it over back over to Tim, and I appreciate the time you, your gift you gave me this morning. Looking forward to hearing from all of you later today. Thanks, Melissa. I appreciate all the work that you and Shelly do on putting these meetings together. I know several of you were contacted uh, by them uh, through the process. Uh, if you are on social media, the program today is being streamed live on Facebook Live through the Department of Agriculture website. And so uh, encourage you to, uh, to tag us and, and let people know uh, what's going on. Uh, during the morning, you're going to hear some really deep information that I think will be good to share with some of your uh, network uh, about the importance of agriculture. This time, our Commissioner of Agriculture, Dr. Ryan Corals, will come up and tell you a little bit about what's going on uh, in Franklin. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Great presentation. Uh, good morning. It's good to see you. It's good to see anybody these days. <laughs> it's good to see it face to face as well. Um, when uh, when I was told that we're going to have a land forum in Western Kentucky, my dad told me uh, we're going to start talking about it this week. I said I'm gone for three days. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, so good to see you all. Uh, some of you haven't seen for over a year, so uh, it's been a tough year. So why are we here? Well, there are two major signature industries in Kentucky. You just heard about manufacturing. It's big, and I know Henderson, congratulations, you just landed a big industry, I think, last week uh, to add to your portfolio. Well, agriculture is big too. And oftentimes in our state, we operate in silos that sometimes you assume there's communication between the industries and sometimes we're just not. And so for the last few years, we've been traveling the state, partnering with CAM, and Department of Agriculture and other sponsors which generously helped put these on to have frank conversations about ways that we can integrate and strengthen both of our industries without having to look to other countries, without having to look uh, on the other side of the United States for potential suppliers, potential ways to integrate. And so oftentimes there's a market in your own backyard that you may not have been aware of. And so the purpose of these meetings is to have discussion we're going to be primed by hearing some stories of some local folks, both on the manufacturing and the ag side as well. But what we want is to try to 
try to integrate these two industries in a little bit better. There's a lot of things that we have in common. You just saw that manufacturing pulls in about $38 billion a year. Kentucky's total economy is about 208 billion in GDP. So they're about 20% of our economy. Well, agriculture is 45 billion in our state. So we're both about 20% each. There's only one industry that employs more people than, ag than agriculture in Kentucky, and that's manufacturing. We employ about 200,000 people across our state, and that includes everyone from farmhands all the way through food manufacturing um, down to the retail side as well. And so we're talking about two um, Goliaths in the room at the same time, and we're, we're very similar industries as well. Think about the following concepts, whether it be on, that, on the ag side or manufacturing. We're both industries that are dependent upon inputs, getting here on time, especially when you're located on the Ohio River, whether it's railways, waterways, byways, highways, and now the access to high-speed internet as well. We're very dependent upon that. Here's a great example of it. Earlier this year, one single ship walked the Suez Canal for about a week, and look what it did to the global economy. Uh, whether it be the price of a cup of coffee, which would affect it, or uh, long-term ability for our suppliers to get uh, goods uh, across, the, across the oceans. Another thing that we're both very dependent upon is trade, that, that if you're pro-agriculture and you're pro-manufacturing, then you're gonna be de facto pro-trade as well. It's so important that uh, the Trump administration left us with several new trade agreements, one with Japan, a new trade protocol with China, on the implementation, the largest trade agreement in the United States history with, with USMCA, with Canada to the north, and Mexico as well, already institutional buyers of both our manufacturing and agricultural goods. There's an opportunity for us to grow together. And instead of sending raw agricultural goods north, why not add that value right here? Why not turn that corn into bourbon, or corn into ethanol, or soybeans into cannibals, what's going on next door, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because whenever you add value, you're one step closer to that final consumer. And as you all know, profitability follows, uh, follows many different steps, but the closer we can get to integration, not just not vertical integration, but the closer we get to integration, the more money is gonna be retained in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and the more jobs will be created. Both of our industries are highly dependent upon an educated and skilled workforce. And sometimes there are perceptions and stigmas that both of our industries have to fight. Uh, you don't want to put an untrained worker into the cab of a combine and say, go at it, go, go at it. Same thing on the manufacturing floor in say the Toyota plant in my hometown in Georgetown, Kentucky. And so we have to have a skilled, educated, drug-free workforce that's going to show up on time uh, on a regular basis. And that is something we're struggling with right now, especially with so many job openings across Kentucky. And of course, uh, we both have been highly affected by supply chain disruptions. And I know that uh, one example of this, and we'll hear a little bit about it later, is think about going to the grocery store a year ago, last April, and, and being able to buy meat. That, that was an acute, short-term supply chain disruption, mainly predicated in the Midwest. And as a result, we decided to pivot. We used precious tobacco settlement dollars. We've invested over $6 million at this point into supporting uh, about 30 or so meat processors here in Kentucky. And that's gonna help us become less dependent upon the Midwest and more dependent upon locally sourced. And so that's a great example of how as policymakers, if we decide to reset the compass, we can help create jobs right here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Here are a few examples of, of agriculture and manufacturing coming together. Of course, so we already mentioned bourbon. Um, food manufacturing, this, this goes all the way from salsa to Kentucky Proud Vendors. By the way, it's National Farmers Markets Week right now, so be sure to go out and support local. Pet food, that's one that really surprises people. We have 40 pet food manufacturers in our state, and they're pulling down major orders of grain and protein, et cetera. And when a consumer is willing to pay $90 for a bag of dog food, uh, might as well have that manufactured right here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky using locally sourced inputs as well. Um, I'm going to Union County after this. They, manu they manufacture a lot of hams there. 
Okay, so that's just another example of that. Um, and of course, we don't want to exclude the, the backbone of ag, which is family-owned businesses. Family-owned businesses. We have 76,000 farms in our state. Each and every one of those, about 97% of those, are family-owned businesses, employing folks. And so when they decide to add on an extra worker to their workforce, it's no different. It's no different than a press release from the Ford plant or the Corvette plant adding a single new job that they're manufacturing as well. So we want to make sure we promote through our chambers of commerce and our policymakers in Frankfurt and Washington, D.C. that ag uh, is just as capable of employing Kentuckians as others as well. And then every once in a while, we'll see a spinoff. Uh, the Martin family down in Todd County uh, decided to uh, get into the road cleaning business and today uh, it can be standard equipment on corn planters around the world, around the world. And that's a great example of how we've connected agriculture and manufacturing together. We can't do this alone. We're very, uh, really happy to have a lot of elected officials here today. I know we have some good executives, a couple of legislators as well. We appreciate that. Appreciate your all's funding uh, through the Ag Development Board, which brings me to my concluding remarks. There are a few things that our state has that others simply do not have. And, and we've got to make sure that we use that when we have a conversation about economic development to make sure that we're firing in all cylinders. Number one, we have a phenomenal, phenomenal extension program in Kentucky, spearheaded by UK and KSU. It's only four states in the entire country that have an extension office in every single county. We're one of them. That's a strength. We also have a very integrated research-oriented higher education community in, in Kentucky as well. So a lot of research is being done here that simply isn't being done elsewhere. I think tomorrow we're going to, to Princeton and stopping by the research farm. That's a strategic asset that our state has that other states simply don't have. So be thinking about that as well. We also have the Kentucky Ag Development Fund and the Ag Finance Corporation uh, headed up under, under the leadership of Executive Director Brian Lacefield here. Uh, we just surpassed $100 million in our loan portfolio. With $100 million that we lend out to help support dreams. Uh, oftentimes for new beginning farmers at very low interest rates, that's something other states can only dream of. And of course, we have uh, the strategic investments that have been made over the past two decades to the Kentucky Ag Development Fund. Uh, about a billion, a little over a billion dollars when you add in the cost here and then reinvest in Kentucky agriculture. And that's the reason why we're able to continue our march with having the best genetics in the world when it comes to poultry and also uh, beef and what we've done in the, 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 uh, the swine industry as well. Those are things that we have that other states simply don't have. So be thinking about that as well. And if you look towards Washington, D.C. right now at USDA, there's a lot of announcements, a lot of grant money being let out, uh, including an announcement just a few weeks ago of a, of a half billion dollars uh, for, to improve local food systems. And so our office is going to continue to evaluate if there's grant opportunities for us to supplant what's, what's already going on with the Ag Development Fund. So if you have any questions on that, we'll be sure to get back to you. So I want to encourage you to ask questions today, encourage you to have discussions. We're going to have a Kentucky Proud Lunch as well. Please sit down with someone that you don't know. Please sit down with someone that you don't know as we encourage that discussion to go forward. I'm so thankful that Tim Hughes has been organizing these across the state. And uh, this this one here in Henderson has some local flair to it. So I'm looking forward to hearing from these FFA students and we'll go on to our panelists as well. So glad to be here today. And of course, uh, if you all have any uh, compliments or complaints, be sure to let me know before I leave today. Appreciate it.
The meeting room will come to order. We are now holding this meeting of the Henderson County FFA chapter. Madam Vice President, are all officers at their stations? I shall call the roll of officers, determine if they're at their station, and report back to you, Madam President. The Treasurer. Stationed by the emblem of Washington. Your duties there? I keep an accurate record of receipts and disbursements, just as Washington kept his bond account, carefully and accurately. I am very strict among the members and encouraged to build up our financial savings through savings and investments. George Washington was better able to serve his country because he was financially independent. The Secretary. Station by the airport. Your duties there? I keep an accurate record of all meetings and correspond with other secretaries where the corner is grown and has a family meeting. The advisor. You're by the owl. Why station by the owl? The owl is a time honor and normal acknowledgement of the owner's university. You can advise you from time to time as you need to write. So my advice for you based on true knowledge and writing is wisdom. I don't know where to write the plow of your station. The plow is a symbol of labor and tillage of the soil. Without labor, neither knowledge nor wisdom can accomplish much. My duties require me to assist at all times in directing the work of our organization. I preside over meetings in the absence of our president. Who places beneath the rising sun? Vice President Sotay. The rising sun is the token of a new era in agriculture. If we will follow the leadership of our president, we shall be led out of the darkness of selfishness and into the glorious sunlight of brotherhood and cooperation. Madam President, all officers are at their stations. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Secretary will call the roll of members. There are four, five members present and numerous guests present now. Thank you. FFA members, why are we here? To practice brotherhood, honor agricultural opportunities and responsibilities, and develop those qualities of leadership which an FFA member should possess. May we accomplish our purposes. I now declare this meeting of the Henderson County FFA chapter duly open for the transaction of business or attention to any matters that may properly be presented. Is there any new business? Madam President. Travis. I move to hold a back to school cookout. Second. It is a move and second to host a back to school cookout. Is there any debate? Madam President. John. I'm in favor of this motion, seeing as the second weekend of school, we usually do have a freshman cookout, and that just would be following with tradition. My second reason in favor of this motion would be that usually if cookouts are something different, we usually do an ice cream social and being a little bit different, maybe we'll attract new members. Madam President. Katie. I recommend to the assembly to adopt this motion. The reason, the reason being is that it's a great way to get our members as a new FFA year around more involved with our chapter, and also it's a great way to get our members more interested and involved with our chapter that will help us throughout the year. Therefore, I recommend to the assembly that the motion be adopted. Madam President, Taylor, I encourage all my fellow members to vote with me in this motion for the following reasons. It's a great way to get people back together right before school starts and to get freshmen lined up to join our agriculture program. Also, in the creed, it states, I believe in the future of agriculture. If we really hone down on our freshmen, they are our future, so it's very important that we get all together and start bonding before the school year starts. For those reasons, I encourage my fellow members to vote with me. Is there any further debate? Madam President. Taylor. I, her, I move to refer this item of business to the committee of three appointed by the chair. Is there a second? Second. It's a moved and seconded to refer this item of business and all remaining details to a committee of three appointed by the chair. Is there any debate? Madam President. Katie. I recommend to the assembly that the motion not be adopted. The reason being is because seeing as it is August 6th already, we need to hammer up the details and get everything organized before August 17th. Also, we have enough manpower here to get this item of business sorted out. Therefore, I recommend to the assembly that the motion not be adopted. Is there any further debate? Madam President. John. I'm in, I'm in, I oppose this uh, I oppose this matter of business because I am one in favor of that that we do postpone this item of business and we can iron out today like my fellow members say. Is there any further debate? The question is on the adoption of the motion to refer. All those in favor of the referral say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. The no's have it and the motion is lost. Is there any further debate on the main motion to host a back-to-school cookout? 
Madam President, Katie, I move to amend the main motion by adding the words on August 17th at the school. Second. It's a moved and seconded to amend a motion by adding the words on August 17th after school so that if, a, if adopted, the motion will read to host a back to school cookout on August 17th after school. Is there any debate? Madam Travis. I'm going to post this amendment for the following reasons. So, for one, on August 17th, we already have our officer training for our new and incoming officers so that we need more positions. We could not hammer out both of these things at the same time because we would be. Uh, Screwing up one or the other. We pick one and go with it, and we've already set down the training of the training day. I don't remember if some members devoted into the training. Madam President, Taylor, I'm not for this amendment for the following reasons. Just like previously said, we already do have an event scheduled on this day, but I do believe a different date would be perfect for this. Because being vice president, I know that we have uh, a lot of different committees like our growing leaders that would be able to take this on. Also, it would be good to do it at the beginning of the year, just so we can start bonding before the school year starts. So for those reasons, I encourage my fellow members to vote with me. Is there any further debate? Madam President. Katie. Being as I need to control my advisor, I move to hold a five-minute recess. Second. It's been moved and seconded to hold a five-minute recess. Are there any amendments? The question is on the adoption of a motion to recess for five minutes. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. 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 The no's have it and the motion is lost. Is there any further is there any further debate on the amendment to the motion which adds the words on August 17th after school? Madam President. Travis. I move previous question on the current amendment on the floor. Second. It's been moved and seconded to hold previous to have previous question has been called for. All those in favor of ordering previous question, please rise. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated. Those opposed, please rise. Thank you, be seated. There are two thirds of the affirmative and previous question will be ordered. The question is on the adoption of the motion, the amendment to the main motion, which adds the words on August 17th after school. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. No. The no's have it and the motion is lost. Is there any further debate on the, the question is on the adoption of the motion to host a back to school cookout. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it and the motion is adopted. We are about to adjourn this meeting of the Henderson County FFA chapter. As we meet with others, let us be diligent in labor, just in our dealings, courteous to everyone, and above all, honest and fair in the game of life. Fellow members and guests, please join me in a salute to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I now declare this meeting adjourned.
my name is Kyle Lancaster. I uh, work for Elfes Farms in Slaughters, Kentucky, which is about 20 miles south of here. We uh, just a little brief of what we do. We're a soy corn, soy corn and soybean producer. We farm about 13,000 acres. Um, we uh, we really push the numbers uh, game. Is how we manage everything, and that got us to, to this discussion of what I'm about to present, which is spray drum. Uh, we've sprayed fungicide for several years using helicopters, airplanes, ground rigs, uh, every, every possible facet of it that you can think. So uh, we got to crunching the numbers and we got to dealing with a company called Helio out of Texas. Uh, there's been a ever so fast changing development in these things even just through the few months that we've dealt with them. And uh, after we looked into them, we decided it was probably a good thing to to give it a shot as opposed to the investment that you have to make with an airplane or helicopter or the tedious task that it is to try to do it for ground rig. Um, so I got some pictures and videos from the farm. Uh, so this is a short video I'm just kind of showing you how the drone flies around the field and kind of getting out. Of the Sets that computer the whole time, make sure they they're flying where they're supposed to, and not 
not we were not. He he tells them to take off and land and all these good things that we're doing. And one guy's running the batteries and one guy's keeping the drones filled up. Uh, this is a picture of what that guy's looking at on the computer screen. Uh, so currently, with those three drones we bombed, they, call, they refer to it as a swarm. That is a, a new concept for this year for spray drones. So we will send, you can send all three of them to one field, or you can send them to different fields. Uh, you can see in the center there where, we're, where the little red arrows are, where we're the landing sites. So it's like right behind the trailer there. And uh, you, can, you can really gain a lot of efficiency out of your people by running multiple drones. If you get down to running just one drone, it becomes a very slow task. You don't get a whole lot done real fast. So with, uh, with the swarm technology and them being able to talk to each other and work together, that's been a game changer for the industry. It really, it wasn't going to be a corn and soybean thing until you could run multiple drones in the same field. <laughs> it, does, it does not always go to plan. Uh, so if you buy a drone, you can plan on crashing. Uh, don't worry, I know these things are expensive, but the average crash, the company told us they'll spend about three to $500 to get it going again. Uh, and that's, that'll get a lot better just because they don't make a whole lot of these parts yet. It's not mass produced, so any part you buy for a drone right now is pretty expensive because they make 100 of them at a time. But uh, we had a lot of problems early on in the, that caused a lot of this that were not the drone's fault, and it wasn't our fault. Uh, I don't want to say it's COVID's fault, but it was a parts problem. As you can imagine with a drone, the only thing that's on this is some carbon fiber tubing, some mold inject injected plastic parts, and electronics, of which two of those things all come from somewhere in Asia. Uh, so that was, a, that was a big problem. Before we even got them, they were having a problem getting parts to assemble them the first time. Uh, to send to us, they were getting parts from people they had never bought parts from, and through that we ran into some problems. We had right off the bat our three drones, we crashed. We crashed the, every day for like the first six days we had them, and no crash was ever deemed the, the drone's fault or our fault. It was we had bad flight controllers, and we didn't know. It took a while to get that figured out, and that was just the parts problem. They they got some parts from somebody that had never bought them from before. Uh, then later on, once we got the flight controllers figured out, we, we had uh, bad, bad propellers, which is just another plastic <coughs> part. Uh, again, they were buying them from somebody else a little cheaper, somebody that never bought them from, and propellers were coming apart. And then by the time we got to the end of it, uh, I think we crashed the drone 12 times before we got done and figured all that out. But, that's all stuff that'll get a lot better uh, as as the industry grows, and it and I do firmly believe that that industry is going to grow. We're missing. Thank God. I thought I had some more pictures there, but this industry is changing so fast, and it's going to grow so much over the next few years. I am a firm believer that ag drones are here and here to stay. They're going to be a part of agriculture. I'm not here to sell you a drone or to tell you you need to go buy one or to not use a helicopter. I'm not knocking helicopters or planes or ground rigs. Uh, but on our farm, it was extremely financially feasible to do this. It was profitable, even though I would have said this year was a disaster. <laughs> uh, but again, not, not due to the drone. It was just due to other circumstances. Uh, it was still a success. It still worked good for us. When the drones were flying, it was I was very tickled with the, the production we were getting. Uh, with the three drones, we could it's very easy to get four or five, six hundred acres a day out of the three of them. So it's uh, we we were pretty pleased with that. Uh, the, the great thing about it is you can go do it when you need to do it. If you've ever hired a helicopter, y'all all know y'all can know how hard it is to get a helicopter show up on time. Uh, if you got a ground rig, how hard it is to get into the field to get over a tall crop or if it's rain. We sat through several rainstorms and as soon as it quit raining, we started flying again. You know, we, there, was, there was no hesitation to, to our operations. So you could, your timing was tremendously better with this as opposed to hiring a helicopter or whatever else you're trying to use. Um, the, the company that we used was Helio. Uh, 
there's not a whole lot of companies out there doing this. Uh, they're, they're a small startup company. They're still in those stages. I mean, they, they've been doing this for years. They started doing this in Central America. They were custom applicating sugar cane. And uh, they just saw it as a business opportunity to, to turn a few dollars as a custom applicator. And they don't custom applicate in America due to regulations and rules. And they're really afraid of some of those things. And that's a whole big another conversation of the gray area, what's all coming there. But uh, the, if you have questions, look, look me up. We can I can talk about these things for hours and hours and hours. We I got a very in depth look at these things. Uh, with, with all the troubles we were having, I, uh, the owner of the company spent ten days on my farm in a row. Uh, so I said, you know, and we talked a lot about what they've done and what we have now. And, where, where this industry is probably headed over the next few years. Uh, perhaps about a year or two out, I'd say you, you can't see far enough ahead to know what it's going to become. It's, a, it's been a real trip with these things. It's, I've seen the good and the bad. So. <laughs> Two or three of us in here used to farm and had to use a backpack sprayer to rub it all. That looked a lot more fun. I don't know. <laughs> this time, I uh, invited our host to come up and tell a little bit about uh, Bex Hybrids. And I know they've been entertaining uh, folks all week. I think they had a thousand uh, plus here earlier this week. So this time, uh, please welcome Reed Chan and Mark Schmidt. <laughs> Uh, farmers here 
Um, we had Sonny Beck, and then now the fifth generation, Corey Beck, if anyone sat in on the talk, Corey Beck was uh, talking to us. So uh, one of the neat things about uh, what I've done in uh, working with farmers is seeing how farmers pass on from one generation to the next. So uh, for me, getting to see Sonny pass things on to Scott, and now uh, Corey start working in the mix is, is very unique. So um, we are a regional company. Uh, we're in 14 states. Um, we've, uh, when, when we started, we're just wanting to try to be able to support and serve the customers that we can uh, locally. So we've, we've gradually grown. Uh, the most recent states we've added would be um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Dakotas, uh, and this year, most recent Kansas, Mississippi, and Arkansas. So we're continuing to grow. We're about in two thirds of the corn and soybean acres in the U.S. is what we market them. A little bit about history about this facility. So in 2006, we uh, leased a building and uh, some land from a farmer dealer large to Fort Branch, Indiana. But as sales and expansion continued south, the Beck family wanted to get their own property uh, in the state, in the south, across the Ohio River. So we started looking at properties in, uh, in Henderson. It was actually the tenant at the time was uh, actually forged out a relationship between the Beck family and the property owner, the McConkey sisters at the time. Um, so as they, as they forged that relationship, they met together. And in 2012, the Beck family ended up purchasing the property. Uh, in July 2013, we ended up starting construction and then occupancy in November 2013. Uh, this facility, there's 11 full-time employees, five of which are distribution and warehouse. Uh, then we also have two in for our practical farm research. So what practical farm research is, Sonny Beck came back from Purdue University in 1964 and started implementing this. And the basis behind it, it's, it's unbiased, independent research about products and practices that can make the product, make the farmer money. It's all about return on investment. Uh, we got six different locations we do that throughout our geography. Uh, and we harvest the harvest crop, uh, put the data in a book, and then we give it out free of charge to anyone that wants it. Uh, agronomic service, we've got a full-time agronomist here, Camille Lambert. So um, she's on staff here anytime, meets with growers, you guys got to challenge her questions. She's, she's a phenomenal asset for Bex. And then we also have three individuals uh, for our research team. And what they do, they go and meet with growers and they become cooperators with them. And they're looking at different inbreds and hybrids down here in the south. And Bex, we want to be a regional location. So we make, we'll make sure we got the right hybrids on these growers' acres for Kentucky. We don't want uh, our growers growing hybrids that need to be in Iowa. So a little bit of backstory about the facility here. Thanks, Reed. Uh, so how, how are we linking uh, agriculture and manufacturing? So we spent some time just trying to identify different ways that we were doing that. Um, you know, one uh, new specialty markets, uh, non-GMO uh, soybeans, corn, uh, with, uh, with those specialty in markets is, is one way there. Um, we've got uh, certain hybrids that we're using uh, with uh, help make the bourbon. Uh, distillers, with Heaven Hill distillers would be one, not limited to them, but that is one we're working closely with. Uh, Chattanooga Whiskey would be another one uh, in the last couple of years in Tennessee uh, we've been working directly with. Uh, we also re-mentioned organics, uh, corn, soybeans, wheat. The organic uh, market continues to grow. And um, in our business with Great Harvest Organics is continuing to grow there as well. Uh, practical Farm Research, um, you know, this afternoon, if you like, we're going to take a tour of the Practical Farm Research. But um, mainly what we're doing on Practical Farm Research is different practices and products um, on a small scale that we can show a farmer, hey, are we doing things to help make a difference that they can increase yield there? So what does that mean for the manufacturing side on the practices? Usually we're using different types of equipment uh, to show uh, different advantages, pro cleaners, closing wheels, uh, different tillage products. Um, so that can help link farmers to different manufacturers there. On the product side of things, insecticides, fungicides, uh, different nutrient type products, uh, linking that, those products with the farmer and the end user there. Um, Independent contractors, you know, the most noticeable one, you see the truck here, uh, shipping and dis uh, distribution out of here. Uh, we use uh, several independent contractors. Um, you know, our processing, you know, where do we get our seed processed? Uh, we look uh, at 
some independent contractors there as well. Uh, most of our seed is processed in-house at a vet's own facility, uh, but we do use some end-user uh, or some processors and uh, outsource some of that there. Our Commitment Rewards Program um, has uh, been a very big program uh, for vets and our customers. Um, it's pretty simple. A customer makes a commitment to us and, and, uh, and then we reward them with an item. Um, you know, the ag economy's been up and down. It looks good right now, but it hadn't always been that way the last several years. And so if we can help uh, a farmer free up some working capital, uh, that's what we're trying to do with the Commitment Rewards Program. So we're working with over 40 different um, companies. Uh, this could be with uh, hopper bottoms, seed tenders, fuel trailers, uh, tractors, you name it. Uh, we're working with several there. And so, again, a way that we uh, help farmers uh, work with some, some manufacturers and end users there. So, um, farmers at heart, that's who we are, that's the, that's the Beck family. Um, continue to farm. Uh, if you ask any Beck employee what their mission is, the bottom line they're going to tell you to help farmers succeed. And we really feel if we continue to try to help people, they're going to continue to reward us with their business. So that's our goal. That's what we do here at this location. Um, that's what uh, every uh, member of our, uh, our employees uh, do, is trying to help farmers succeed. So why help farmers succeed? This is, this is actually uh, the discharge letter from my great, 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 great grandfather from the Union Army in December of 1864. So at 26, he got discharged from the Army, met the Ranyan brothers, came back to Southern Illinois, started farming, started a family. 157 years later, in six, we're in our sixth generation, but we're still on that family farm. Uh, Mark and I both come from family farms. Uh, why help farmers succeed? We wanna make sure that not only our farm, but every farm is handed down to the next generation. Um, and that's what we should all focus on every day in the world of agriculture. Uh, one thank everyone for their time. Uh, one thank Bob and Tim for asking us to be the host today. We really appreciate it. Everyone who came out today. Uh, we do have the buggy set up, so afterwards, if you guys want to take a tour of the PMR farm, we'll be glad to show you around. Uh, what else? Wi Fi password is guess net. You not a lot of questions. So if you're trying to get on internet, that is the Wi Fi password. Beans and protecting corn and soybeans, and what do you do with them? Uh, for the last 35 plus years, uh, we've been growing a lot of chickens in Kentucky. Uh, it's now our largest agricultural enterprise, over a billion dollars in farmer seeds. And we're going to hear about one of those sectors from Nathaniel Key with Calmaine Hoods. So in Todd and then also Millburg County uh, when 
and I actually began my career with Cal Lane. We were the second largest employer in Todd County behind the school system. So, Cal um, uh, is has is, is had a uh, had an impression in, in this state for, for some time now. Um, just to bring that down in a numbers game of actually what we produce in a year, and this is current as of this morning, out of both counties, we produced $48,252,985 eggs in Kentucky this past year. So, to uh, my one and all, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> and in 2020 alone, as a company, Cal Maine, we produced 1.69 million dozen shell eggs. So, um, a lot of ways for the best kept secret, but. Cal Maine is committed to the state of Kentucky. Cal Maine is committed to, to having a relationship in this state to where would it be donating eggs last year at the beginning of the pandemic uh, and to all the way to, as Dr. Corbis mentioned his presentation of uh, dog food companies. We actually have a partnership with Champion Dog Food and Bowling Green. So from large and small all the way to the hardware store up the road, we're here on a first name basis. Our managers, our staff go there. We have relationships in the, in our counties and in our community because we're a part of the community. And that is something that Cal Maine Foods put at the forefront. In each and every state that we that we are involved in, we're primarily in the uh, in the uh, southeast, but we go as far as Utah. But that is still a cornerstone in our company to believe in and a further relationship uh, in each state that we that we are in. And uh, in closing, Cal Maine is committed to this Commonwealth, is committed to putting a sustainable and nutritional product, and most importantly, at an affordable price, in the homes in each and every fellow Kentucky in the state. And if you all have any questions, feel free to contact me and get done. Thank you for your time. Second, but uh, while Shelly is doing that, uh, we have a couple of questions. We are quite through. Uh, we heard from Vince earlier. How many operations like this do you all have uh, throughout your network? Ones, so, ones that we build ourselves or yes, in this regional location? We have, we have built three With 95% of consumers flight. living outside. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have built ourselves three others like this, and then we've also purchased two others. We have six regional locations like this facility in Cotter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Just for you guys. Okay, okay. sure. I noticed in the, the list of ag related jobs generated from the meat search, put Red Lobster and Chipotle on there. And I'm wondering why are they included? I'm sure there's a good reason. So, anytime you put in manufacturing and farming, food is part of that, and it'll come up in that, in that list. And what's interesting is uh, anytime you put in most, what I have found in those searches, Anytime you put in most industries, there's always some type of gas station, restaurant, some sometimes that nature that actually comes out out of the hospitality industry because it's associated to something in manufacturing, something in farming. So that association is derived from the spider web that goes out. Does that make sense? That's what we call the search algorithm. Genetics and things like that. To see the drone and 
the technology that goes into that piece of equipment. And, and all of that connects back to somebody that's making those products and that ties into the manufacturing. And a lot of times we'll visit the companies that are bringing in products or ingredients for things from other states, and they don't have any idea of the sophistication of our agriculture in Kentucky. All right, at this time, I want to thank Brandon Hunt to come up and put arms. And uh, they're involved in a lot of different uh, aspects of agriculture and uh, been involved in leadership programs. Brandon, before you remark. Hey, thank you for the opportunity to come today. A um, tad bit of a panic sitting over here because I didn't put anything together for you guys. I thought we were going to have a nice discussion up here with questions. So I'm throwing a couple of slides together <laughs> off of. Uh, off of the chamber stuff that I've, I've done at home in the past and uh, just give you a little bit of background and hopefully I'm going to keep on pretty short so maybe we can have some discussion but it's, uh, I love talking agriculture and, and uh, with different people and I just thought I'm going to skip that uh, skip that part today. So just a little bit of family history about us. Uh, <clears throat> I'm from Christian County, Kentucky, Herndon, Hopkinsville area. Uh, our farm and operations pivoted right next against the military base Fort Campbell. Uh, we can't, we make a ginormous L right around it, can't hardly uh, get off our ground and not touch Fort Campbell. So we're all the way around starting on the runway and come all the way down to where they um, play with the big guns down toward the southern uh, part of Trick County. So our ancestors settled on our farm in 1797. Fort Campbell um, was formed around 42. And uh, they kind of drew a line and went around our farm. Uh, good Lord, what snap piece that day. Uh, we've got a pretty important asset that it enables us to irrigate quite a bit of crops there on our farm. And uh, they almost took it for their water source, but they found one on down south and kind of went around us and it's uh, enabled us to do what we're doing today. Large scale production agriculture started for us around 62, or 61, I'm sorry, uh, with my granddad and my father. <coughs> Uh, today we farm 10,000 acres there about in two counties, Christian and Drew County. Uh, we raise corn, wheat, soybeans. Uh, we had raised some canola. Uh, we still raise some dark fire tobacco. And we're still dabbling a little bit of the, of the hemp market. Um, we survived through the, through the last two years of it. We're still uh, pursuing some uh, end results of that crop today. <clears throat> got seven full-time employees. I've uh, got seven migrant uh, H2A employees. We hire six part-time people to get us through harvest planting season. And we've got uh, two people in the office kind of help keep me straight. Uh, we are a family farm. Commissioner alluded to it whenever he, he gave his open remarks. That's really important for our state. Uh, it's important for our story. And it's important for how we operate in the industry and the uh, connections we're able to build with, with different industries. Uh, it's one thing I'm super proud to be associated with and I can't think of a better way to uh, explain agriculture. I'm the fourth generation, I'm raising the fourth generation um, right now. Um, picture of my, oh, one picture I need to update and I don't have one. We just had a brand new baby. She's a four and a half months. Uh, so we're about to update the, uh, update the family photo. Married my wife in 2008. <clears throat> uh, God bless us with Case Ethan in 2011 as our first child. And uh, my dad and my granddad are still involved in our farm operation today at a distant level. Um, we're associated somewhat in the manufacturing sector, so we sell uh, farm equipment, uh, H&R Agri-Power, Case Ice dealers, and uh, cover a pretty good territory from uh, 18 dealerships in about seven states. So um, we're tied to agriculture in different ways, as my granddad has uh, been a banner waiver for Kentucky agriculture his entire career and it's pretty big shoes to fill. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come up here like today and get to talk about it because it's super important to keep to keep those relationships open as we're going forward uh, with future generations. So a new age of British production agriculture, this is one of my favorite slides um, that I usually use from time to time. We produce and consume the highest quality and the safest food source today in the world in the United States and uh, I'm proud to be associated with that. Spent a lot of time trying to tell that story uh, to, to people that aren't you know, as educated about agriculture as previous generations used to because 
your generations are getting removed and removed further and further off the farm. So it's important that we have those conversations and make sure that people have the utmost uh, comfort level in what they're consuming and how we're growing it for them to consume in their diets. Uh, the U.S. is the most technologically advanced country in the world. I don't think there's any uh, denying that. And boy, technology is generating and making agriculture thrive today, pushing us into new frontiers, as Kyle showed, and that's just one snippet of what tech's doing for us. And uh, the technological advancements has been made just in my farming career. I'll be 36 in September, and man, it's changed a lot, even since I graduated high school in three. So I can't even really wrap my head around what my son's gonna be able to endure and participate in and do better with the technology that are climbing through us today. Um, resources in agriculture don't recreate themselves. And I think this is another super important point. Uh, so we as farmers, we have to take care of them. And uh, we'll see a lot of that stuff coming in the news wires, I think, uh, as more and more pressure gets put on environmental aspects of agriculture. Um, I'm not sure that that story always gets told well. And that's partly our fault for not educating and not uh, telling how we do it and showing how we do things. And I think a, a lot of the companies that we sell in, in products to today, and some of you may be in the room, uh, that sustainability talk is very important today. And it's becoming a widespread uh, communicational issue that we're gonna do a better job of, of communicating that we are sustainable um, and the, the most sustainable um, agriculture on the planet, in my opinion. So we take care of things the way we need to be taken care of. Um, we can't we can't recreate our farm ground, and we can't produce more of it. So it's our responsibility, and ones we don't take lightly, to uh, protect that and steward it in a way that produces the commodities that are needed in the in the manufacturing sector and for the general public consuming their diets. So margins are tighter today than ever before in agriculture. Uh, even pre-COVID pre had a lot more pressure on it, and COVID's caused us issues just like I'm sure it has you also. Uh, margins are tight, and time's not able to be made. Uh, we can only operate within the time schedules we have, so uh, technology is, is a super important tool in our toolbox today, and it's gonna become even more important going forward. So, uh, uh, farming is a complex business, and has multiple moving parts, just like um, everybody's uh, business populations ever ever increasing and they have to eat. The amount of acre, the amount of acres dedicated to production agriculture isn't growing and it's not going to continue to expand. So we're having to and are able to uh, produce more to meet the growing demand on uh, less acres. So I've already alluded to it once, but uh, just to say it again, we're stewards of the land. We can't make uh, more soil, so we have no choice but to take care and improve the land that God's given us the opportunity to manage. And uh, I truly believe that. It's, it's what I use my uh, kind of my motto. You know, God put us on this earth to take care of what He's given us, and farmers are the one of the banner waivers for that, in my opinion. So, uh, technology and science are pivotal for agriculture going forward. And no matter what the fake news says, you're consuming the highest quality uh, food in the world. And I'm proud to be part of that industry, and uh, thank you for your support. <laughs>
more rules. I'm not really promoting and asking for people to come tell me how to do it, but there, there does need to be more language written into the rules. The problem is right now nobody knows exactly what to do as far as the legislation would go. They're afraid to do anything, to have to redo it in a couple of years. So there, there's no doubt they're trying to let the industry develop a little bit before they jump in and start making rules and telling people how to do things. There is, you do require a license to legally fly on right now. There is a program you have to go through, especially if you're putting on pesticides. We did not put on any pesticides just to avoid that whole situation. I mean, we were mainly after fungicide applications, but there's a, for every drone you have, you have to legally right now, you have to have a licensed operator. So we have to have three licensed operators on the farm to fly the swarm of others. They weren't that good because I needed three people in the field anyway. Uh, but there's a, there's a, there, you can't fly over roads. You can't fly within 100 feet of a non participating uh, entity or person. Like you, if you're flying next to your neighbor, you have to stay 100 foot away from them. And that's just it's purely for safety in case a drone does go down. It'll be to the ground before it travels 100 foot. We're not supposed to do like We're flying 15 foot off the ground, so it's not like they get real far out. There's, there's definitely a, a lot to come on that front over the next three or four or five years. So another question here, Ms. Hunter. I was curious about uh, how it compares the helicopter or the airplane or the ground per acre cost per in investment. So it'll be that drastically different for depending on who you are and how many acres you're covering. Uh, we, we were told by the company that we bought ours from that we were the most progressive people that they had dealt with yet. So we were pushing the most acres out of anybody would think try. And from, it depends on how you want to look at the cost of the drone, like how long you want to. We looked at it on a three year deal, because this is, let's face it, drones don't, they go out of date about as fast as a desktop computer, right? Uh, so we figured if they, after three years, if we throw them away, uh, that's how we looked at it. We figured in three years they'll have something else out, but one throw those away and buy them. It is drastically cheaper. Drastically cheaper. Uh, to give you an exact number, I, it, you know, that, that's just going to vary on your operation, how you're doing things. But, um, but uh, less than half, at least, way less than half, uh, from our experience. Anyway. Um, so, are any of the other funders looking at that option? Is it? So I, I currently have a drone. I don't have a spray drone like Colin does. I'm on the, uh, Fort Campbell gives me a little bit of a fit using drones. <laughs> so I have to be careful. I can get outside of the circle that I'm able to fly. So I use, I use drones to scatter my crops and uh, stuff like that. I have not started spraying it. I think that's the way we'll hit. And Kyle's on the forefront of that for sure. So I'm, I've been a little bit lackluster in going full blown drones just because so much of my acreage is up against the landing strip. And uh, I think as the <clears throat> rules and regulations roll down, I'll, uh, they can't put me out of business and say I can't ever fly. Uh, I don't think, I guess they can, but <laughs> I don't think they will. I think the cop said it, you know, it's pretty new. And, uh, there was a time and place when I started drone. I, I know the guy that was in charge of their traffic control tower there on Fort Campbell, and we had a great relationship. He said, yeah, no problem. He said, you call and tell him when you're gonna fly. He said, I'll tell you what's in there. If you can, if you can, if you can't, you go another day. It's no trouble. Well, it got higher than him and went to the Department of Defense. And it was one of the, I forget, it was one of them that hit the news line. When maybe they crashed one in the White House lawn or something, a drone back, I don't know, five, six years ago. They said, Ooh. <laughs> Nothing around our airspace, you're not going up. It's good enough, no problem. So I think it'll evolve, and I, I mean, it's going to be the way of the future. It's going to be a pretty good tool for our in our toolbox, I think, going forward. He's just, uh, he's ahead of it right now, and commended for it. I think it's, it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a good avenue. Already has several great points that are viewed, and it's just going to continue to get better. Anybody else considering it? Yeah, Mr. Hunter, I'm going to go we're we're testing the uh, drones uh, we've got a guy jim love on our staff and he does nothing uh, but uh, work with drones and look at different kinds but not only uh, for spraying but also scouting sting counts 
uh, we talked about our choice trials. Those, I think our companies have those, but they can use those to uh, uh, go out and get scan counts, uh, look at crop health imaging, uh, many different uses. Uh, but I think it's going to continue to grow very quickly. So, I'm sorry, just a follow-up. There was a reason I did that. So, do they have to have a special type of license to drive? You were saying there's requirements, but I know that some of the manufacturing have to have CNC type courses or some machines. I was just curious if any of the manufacturing jobs would kind of lend into something like that. If you know. I, uh, the, the company that we bought ours from, they had a program to help us. They went hand in hand with it to help you get your license properly. Uh, a large part of that is on the, as far as the, the part that people really care about that we're doing correctly. It's not like learning to go fly a helicopter. We don't fly on them, but the computer flies them. We set them on the ground, tell it what to do, hit go, and it's gone. And it flies itself back. We're not driving around. Uh, the, the big part of it is just to make sure you're safely applying chemical. It's, it's no different than us going to get a, a sprayer application for, for the farm for your ground rig. It's just a whole different training because you're doing from there. Uh, but to elaborate a little bit on how like Brandon was talking about Fort Campbell, uh, our drones all have the black box on them, just like a Boeing 747 has on it. So when we reckon when they can go get the black box, they can, they can tell us what we did. They'll tell you how high we were flying, how fast we were flying, you know, GPS coordinates on, on where it was at. So that'll just be standard equipment on all drones. Over that be part of regulation, and you'll have to be able to provide those records whenever somebody asks them. Question: Where do you think technology goes from here? What, what do you see as the next big development in agriculture? Precise. Um, you know, people started managing kind of things in the whole farm aspect. You, know, you got the farmers going breaking things down uh, more by field. It's going to continue to get more and more micro seed by seed. Um, you know, there's some things out here with the uh, arrow tube uh, seed spacing that we're looking at, and, and, it, and when you're planting, it's trying to uh, turn that seed to a specific angle uh, and, and, and direction. Uh, so different technologies that help get things more and more micro. Uh, so you're managing uh, by the seed, even side by the acre, uh, anything down those lines, will be, I think we'll be seeing them. In regards to uh, my field, more of the animal side, uh, specifically egg production, uh, things continue to transition to uh, <laughs> different dynamics in the style of chicken houses are uh, continue to be built and due to different regulation and so to speak, different uh, environmental uh, impacts that are uh, becoming more and more prevalent. The more of the, the technology side of the, of the chicken houses and how we do what we do adapts to that uh, is will continue to evolve. I mean, as far as the day, the day routine and, and all that kind of thing and the process and the end of our business is ever evolving, ever changing. Machines get faster, we get more efficient, more computer automated versus, you know, chains and gears and grease and the more traditional side. And that's all, all shifted away, but really the bread and butter and so to speak are really in my position, all the eggs in the basket. Uh, or more in the lines of the uh, technology and the, the chicken has to build. Right. So I think, you know, technology is a big basket. So uh, we could stand up here and talk for hours on what technical parts are going to change, whether it's from the seed side and how we place that seed and how fast it grows and how we treat these seeds, which we're heading that way very rapidly. And you get down to the, to the per acre on a farm where we're treating every acre the best we can for two reasons 
to be the best stewards and what it takes to keep that acre profitable. And then ultimately we've got to stay in business and we have to make money and manage our costs around that acre. And you know, it could be five, six, seven, eight different technologies that can make that uh, profitability better. And then you get into the cool stuff like Kyle's doing with drones or I'm doing with drones. And, and I get blown up to where we get to autonomous farm equipment and that's kind of happening. Uh, you know, Tesla can do with a car. We're not far from doing it with a tractor. And uh, what that looks like, I think, you know, it could, it could be five, six, seven different how to get there is whether, you know, I take me and three people and we move the equipment to the farm. And I think this is the entry level how we're going to start the safest. We get that equipment to the farm and we turn it loose. And we sit at the end and we fill it and tender it and monitor it. And then, you know, maybe sometime in my son's lifetime, he's going to hit the button, it's going to come out of the shed and it's going to go where he sends it. And it's going to come back. So, uh, you know, and then we get plumbed down to fertility at technology and how we fertilize our crops for profitability and for stewardship. And that's going to continue to evolve. And, uh, uh, it, uh, like I said, technology is such a, a broad spectrum term. Uh, the possibilities are endless, and I don't know that we could probably sit up here and wrap our head totally around it today and tell you what we're going to be looking like in 10 years because it could change in 10 days. So uh, that's part of what makes this career enticing and enjoyable and uh, what makes me get up in the morning other than trying to feed the world is figure out what new, new way we're going to use an avenue to get to where we need to go. Give our speakers a round of applause. So you had your opportunity to ask some questions from the seat. Uh, now you've got some homework. Uh, two things. I want to ask what sector you're from. How many of you are farmers today? How many of you work for some level of government, local, state, federal? How many are in the uh, service industry, finance, uh, insurance, equipment? How many are in the manufacturing sector? How many are in academia, uh, schools at some level? So you see how diverse the audience is. So during lunch, I want you to visit with somebody and see what you can learn from them about their aspects and their connection to agriculture. Number two, uh, at the end of the day, I want to ask you uh, a one-word summary of what you've learned or what you saw today during the presentations. But uh, while you're thinking about that, uh, we have Casey Todd with Hometown Roots. He's going to talk to you about what we're getting ready to experience for lunch and where it came from. Welcome, guys. See a lot of familiar faces out there. It's nice to see all of you guys. Um, tell a little bit about our story, what we do. Um, we were reach out to do this catering event, and we wanted an emphasis on local purveyors. Um, that's something that we do on a daily basis. We try to preach that. We try to live that in literally every every avenue of the restaurant and everything that we do. So with that being said, with, right now with our produce, um, we're about 80% local on every bit of our produce that we use in, throughout the entire restaurant. Um, we're a big partner with Andy Seymour with Seymour Farms. You guys may know those guys out of McLean County. They do all of our greens. They do um, they have a massive hydroponics greenhouse that they use. We use their bib lettuce, leaf lettuce, and their spring mix. We use that in all of our salads, anything else we do with greens as well, um, which is a huge right now. We use Hayden Farms, also out of McLean County. They do all of our tomatoes at the moment. And looking down, he's got a few new high tunnels as well. He's looking to be able to provide us with tomatoes for you know seven to eight months out of the year, which is huge for us. So kind of talk about our menu a little bit. We're working on a new concept. It's gonna be downtown next to our coffee shop. It's called Homer's Barbecue. So this is kind of a blend between the barbecue place and also hometown roots. Um, but right now we're gonna have pulled pork this afternoon. We sourced those from Biddle Farms out of Davis County. Um, we partnered with Biddle Farms when we first opened. At one point, we were using 100% local beef and pork. At the moment, we're not using 100% um, their beef and bacon. Their processor had a large fire about a year and a half ago. So I kind of struggled with that. They're kind of getting back on their feet, so we hope to get it, dive into that as soon as possible. Talked with George over the past couple weeks and a little bit yesterday as well. And they're hoping to roll back production in early September, so hopefully we'll be able to get back into that. Um, the next one's gonna be some smoked chicken. Our kind of local tie to that is we're using Cardinal Farms peach wood. So Tim Alexander with Cardinal Farms, I'm sure you guys know him. It's in the middle of peach season. You see his peach truck driving around town all over the place. 
but he'll supply um, hopefully peach wood year round for us for the barbecue place. So we'll use a peach wood, which will be kind of our, our softer fruit wood, and we'll mix that with the hardwood when we smoke um, for the barbecue place. We've also got um, our jalapeno cream corn. That's something we have on the menu all the time at Hometown Roots. Um, we've recently partnered with um, the high school and their culinary program. So we've got two culinary interns um, from the high school. They're wanting to work on their knife skills. So whenever they decided they wanted to work on their knife skills, it happened to be sweet corn season. So you guys have all shucked and um, cut up some sweet corn. So they did that for four weeks straight. Massive amounts of sweet corn. So we basically cut that off the cob. We stuck that in the freezer. And I'd say we'll have fresh sweet corn for the next two to three months, depending on how business goes. So they really got their uh, work in on their knife skills, which is great. We also just have some uh, fresh roasted vegetables. Those are all coming from Kate's, Kate's Farms. We have some squash, zucchini in there. Also some radishes from Fresh Cut Farms. Donnie is our man at Fresh Cut Farms. We call him the collard green man. So we have collard greens on our menu. We use collards, mustards, and turnips. He can pretty much provide us collard greens nine to 10 months out of the year, which is really neat. And the process of breaking those down, if you guys have ever seen that or done that, is a, is a huge task. Once again, the culinary kids from the high school are helping out a lot with that. But he brings us four or five massive plastic totes of collard greens and mustards and turnips um, weekly, which is huge. Um, but also adds to that flavor, but also trying to live that farm to table, kind of using the local purveyors as much as humanly possible. So we mix that with some cabbage, make some coleslaw, put a little collard greens in there. That's our aspect there. We also got some dessert. That's gonna be a peach and blueberry cobbler. Peaches obviously from Cardinal Farms. And then our blueberries are coming from First Fruit Farms. Miss Pauline, she's a, a huge berry grower. We try to stash as many berries as we possibly can during season. That way we can use those for our baking in the coffee shop. Also for random desserts and also our bar mixes. We use um, fresh ingredients for those as well, which is really neat. So. We also have some jalapeno cornbread. That's kind of our staple at the restaurant. So thank you guys for having us. I appreciate it. You guys enjoy, all right? Well, I thought y'all did a good job, but I'm all excited now. Uh, what we're going to do is have you walk out this door. Uh, you'll see the area to get your plate, and then come back in the back door. Uh, the restrooms are on the outside, uh, down the hallway. And uh, we'll try to get started back as close to 12.30 as possible. But uh, like I said, visit with somebody, enjoy lunch, and uh, thanks again for everybody's focus on